So when my daughter was in middle school, she came home from school one day and told me that her teacher had been talking to the class about technology. And to illustrate her point, she'd shown a slide comparing an old-fashioned television to a very modern one. And much to my daughter's amusement, the old-fashioned TV, of course, looked very similar to the one we had in our family room at the time. <laughs> so <laughs> I think the point is I'm a scientist, and usually people assume that I'm going to be very tech-savvy. But in actuality, I've found that as technology has become more complex, it's become more difficult for me to really understand or even navigate all the, the complexity of the various devices that I use on a daily basis. Generally, I don't worry about the science behind them. I buy them and I use them, and I don't really think about what went into making them. And we talk a lot about trying to educate the next generation in science and math because it's important for them to keep us from falling behind. But I'm wondering about now. You know, science isn't just a subject that we teach in our schools. It's the tools that we use to understand the world around us. And so what makes a good scientist isn't their intellect or their acquisition of a lot of information, but it's curiosity. And so curiosity inspires learning. And if you're curious about something, that's what really compels you to truly understand it to the point where you can integrate it and retain that knowledge. So my village is a small laboratory up in Orono, Maine, where my company has invented a new filtration technology. And this innovative technology was based solely out of curiosity. Six years ago, I sent my partner, Carl, down to the materials research meeting in Boston. And I remember him turning to me and saying, you know, you know, why am I going and why am I going to this meeting? Because I'm a biophysicist, I'm not a material scientist. And so I explained to Carl that, well, in material science, we just formed, formed a materials company together, and I said, biology is really a core discipline, and we always turn to nature to inspire us with new ideas for new materials. So Carl went, and when he came back, he said a couple things, one being that engineers really don't know a lot about DNA, which was his field, and also he had a new idea. And so his idea was this. We've been working with what's called a porous ceramic material, and so we were making very tiny holes in ceramics. And he thought, I could make those holes with DNA. And I, so that was very interesting, and it was very novel, because most people, when they think about DNA, think about... Okay, DNA, blueprint of life, what we learned in school, a single strand contains all the information that you need to grow an entire organism. But Carl had been working with it for almost 20 years, and he, to him, DNA had a size and a shape. And so he thought of it as a tool. And he said, well, what if I use DNA to make holes in ceramics? What would happen? W how big would these holes be? And then, of course, you know, my input was, and what would we use it for? Because, you know, we're a company. And so... <laughs> So Carl's idea became the technology that we're currently working with. And what we do is we've developed over the years a recipe where we incorporate the DNA and the ceramic, and then we organize it and we heat it up and remove the DNA so that what's left behind is a very thin, and, I, and very thin, like as thin as a cell, layer of ceramic that has incredibly small holes, each the same size, the size of the DNA that we removed. And what this is useful for is we can apply this coating to the inner surface of a commercial um, ceramic filtration tube. And so the result is we've created a filter that is made out of ceramic and can highly purify fluids like water and fuels and other things. And the end result is that with this very small change, making these very tiny holes, we've been able to create a huge impact because the ability of this filter is that it can actually save energy. And we've calculated from the results in our lab that if you replace a commercial evaporator with our filtration tubes on a, in a process where you're trying to remove 6,000 gallons of water a day in an industrial setting, you could actually save enough energy to remove 1,200 tons of carbon per year. That's equivalent to the amount of carbon removed by 400 acres of forest. So it turns out that creating an energy-saving filter is incredibly valuable today. And that's because when, in times when energy is considered cheap, there's not a lot of incentive to replace equipment, even if your new idea saves money and energy. There's just the incentive doesn't exist. But because of the world's growing population, we're seeing an increasing stress on the resources of energy, water, and food. And in fact, there's more than a billion people currently who live without access to clean drinking water or, ha or don't have enough food to eat or live without electricity. And the real problem is that if you try to address any one of these issues, you make the other two worse. And this is known as the water energy food nexus. And it's true because it takes a tremendous amount of water and energy to grow and transport food. It takes energy to purify and transport water. 
And in the production of power in our country, we consume a great deal of our freshwater resources. And so the key to sustainability is to develop and support technologies like ours that actually can make processes more efficient without negatively impacting these three interconnected resources. So right now, we're applying our technology to an industry that's right here in Maine. And that is the industry that's trying to create fuels out of trees. Now, it just so happens that in Maine, we have a number of sustainable energy sources that have a very low impact on this water energy nexus. And those include wind power, which uses no water, tidal energy, and the idea of using the cellulose from trees to create a biofuel. So all three of these are, if you look at a scale of the water energy nexus, they rank very low on that scale. The problem with taking trees to fuel is it's a very complex system. There's a high acid content in trees, so our filter works very well because it's a ceramic, and you're trying to extract a very small amount of sugars. And so our holes are very small, so we can do this process too. And the reason this is an efficient process for Maine is we're already harvesting and transporting those trees for another purpose. We're taking them to pulp and paper mills to make paper and pulp out of them. And so we work on, or the people we work with, work on taking the waste wood and converting it to something valuable. And so my argument would be, even though right now it's very complex, much more complex than converting corn to ethanol, it's really better because taking a crop and converting it to a fuel uses quite a bit of water in, in, in addition to impacting a potential food source. In fact, agriculture uses 70% of the fresh water today. And so while this process may initially be more expensive, in the end, I believe that its real value will be that it impacts the water energy nexus less. And so we'll have more value than just the fact that it's a renewable resource. And so finally, my challenge is that when you go out and look at technology and purchase technology for yourself, or perhaps are voting on supporting a certain type of technology, be curious and spend some time to learn about what goes into making that technology and what happens to that technology when you're done using it. Because in the end, this one small change can have a tremendous impact on our future. So thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.